Um, it's an opportunity for our fellows um, who have been uh, involved in discussing space and place, reading about space and place, writing about space and place, and sharing that work with each other for the year to sort of reflect on um, what that that experience has meant to their own work from and they, they're, as you will see from a range of disciplines in a minute i'll ask each one to come up and give you about four minutes uh, about that process and then they'll sit here and we'll carry on the conversation but before that i just wanted to say a few things myself i'll take this opportunity to um uh you know, oh, I don't know be a bit provocative perhaps i'm not sure if it is but anyway we'll see um so I want to talk about space, place, uh, and the triumph of the humanities. Triumph is missing from there. So, um, so over the academic year, the annual theme of the Humanities Centre Fellowship Program has been space and place. As a geographer uh, displaced to history and international affairs, here at Northeastern, it was, as I've already said, a delight to be involved uh, straight away in an interdisciplinary discussion of these themes, which I'm so used to talking uh, with geographers about. Um, and I believe that these themes are fundamental to life in the 21st century, as indeed any other century, but um, particularly with some of the kinds of themes that many of us uh, have as our university research priorities, like sustainability, health, security, all of those things that uh, the Northeastern themes, that I'm sure I've seen them in other places as well. Um, our conversations, uh, uh, have crisscrossed the humanities and social sciences in ways which point towards the richness of um, an emerging field uh, which um, has been tagged geo-humanities, some people call spatial humanities. The rise of geo-humanities has been prompted most of all by a recent emerging uh, set of techniques in digital humanities um, and various forms of geo-mapping and um, geocoding and geotagging, and also the rise of um, uh, locative media and our sort of GPS uh, loaded phones and all kind of information that comes with that. Um, and it was these developments and, and a couple of papers in this book here, Geo Humanities, which, is a, which was a product of AAG efforts, of the Association of American Geography efforts. It was this um, book and an essay in it in particular on the kinds of mapping techniques we saw Peter talking about in the, that led uh, to Stanley Fish, the, the professor of English and um, person who became, I believe, in David Lodge's novels, Professor Zapp. Um, for those of you who read those, um, to reflect on what he calls um, somewhat optimistically and perhaps a little prematurely the triumph of the humanities um, uh, after reading this book, and uh, well, he's reading some of it. Um, he was excited about a number of technical and theoretical developments that allowed time and space, as we again have seen to some degree with Peter's presentation, to be represented as constantly in co-constitutive motion. Uh, he called this new project a synthesis of geographical information science, which he said in his article was the new name for geography, which isn't entirely true, um, and, um, and history, uh, to bring forth a kind of geographical imagination and poetics that asserts the active and dynamic role of space and place in most, if not all, important questions. It's worth quoting at length his confident assertions, so I'm, I'm going to do that. This is the second part of this quote, but the first, so the first part's not up there, but so this is what Stanley Fish wrote. What this all suggests is that while we have been anguishing over the fate of the humanities, the humanities have been busily moving into and even colonizing the fields that were supposedly displacing them. In the 70s and 80s, the humanities exported theory to the social sciences and with less influence to the sciences. Many disciplines saw a pitched battle between the new watchwords, perspective, contingency, dispersion, multivocality, intertextuality, and I would like to say they're probably Stanley Fish's watchwords, but anyway, and the traditional techniques of dispassionate observation, the collection of evidence, the drawing of warranted conclusions, and the establishment of solid fact. Now the dust has settled and the invaded disciplines have incorporated much of what they resisted, um, propositions that once seemed outlandish, all knowledge is mediated, even our certainties are socially constructed, are now routinely asserted in precincts where they were feared as the harbingers of chaos and corrosive relativism. And then this sent paragraph here, one could say that the humanities are the victors in the theory wars. Nearly everyone now dances to their tune. 
I, I haven't had that discussion with the physics department yet. Um, but this conceptual triumph has not brought with it a proportionate share of resources or institutional support. Perhaps administrators shall think of the humanities as the province of precious insights that offer little to those who are charged with the task of making sense of the world. Volumes like Geo Humanities tell a different story, and it's one that cannot be rehearsed too often. So it was certainly heartwarming as a geographer to read Professor Fish's words, but it was also a little strange. To someone such as myself, it felt as though he'd just discovered the wheel for the first time, let alone rediscovered it. And it's ironic that a term such as geo humanities should arise as a result of a technical ability to process and display data in new ways. Um, many of us in the geography community just said that's geography, right? Um, just with a lot more added to it. I prefer to see the term as an affirmation of several thousand years of humanistic thought rather than several decades of technological development in GIS labs, a history that I now want to rehearse over a couple of minutes. So. Um, I, sorry for those of you who think this is Geography 101, but anyway. A concern with space and place was at the center of classical thought. Um, Aristotle famously argued that place takes precedence over all things because everywhere that exists must be somewhere. Because what is not is nowhere, where, for instance, is a goat stag or a sphinx. Greek philosophers and historians were also geographers. Herodotus claimed that as the father of both anthropology and history, spent much of his time trying to find the source of the Nile and might reasonably be, be claimed as the father of geography too. Um, uh, meanwhile, the, library, the librarian of Alexandria, Eratosthenes, was busy measuring the earth and developing the system we now know as latitude and longitude, and which locates your every thought and move through your cell phone uh, on Foursquare and whatever other app you use. He's known as a mathematician, geographer, poet, astronomer, and music theorist. The first person to call himself a geographer was um, Strabo, or Strabo, as some people prefer to call him, um, who was a philosopher and historian, as well as a geographer. Uh, the teaching of Aristotle on the fundamental importance of place um, was revived in Europe by Albertus Magnus, the German Dominican scholar who tutored Thomas Aquinas. His De Natura Locorum, the nature of places, combined cosmology with natural science to insist on in the importance of location to everything, where even rocks, if they were in the wrong place, would fall apart because they were unsuited to where they were. He, um, he was a philosopher, a theologian, and a Catholic saint, amongst other things. And then there's, um, oh, we we'll get back to that. Then there's, of course, Immanuel Kant, that's this guy here, um, who most definitely a philosopher, as we know, but who spent 40 years giving lectures on geography, and probably lectured more on geography than anything else. This, this story could go on and includes the great Muslim scholar Ibn Khaldun, claimed as one of the fathers of history, sociology, and economics, as well as geography, and the unnamed Chinese cartographers of the Han Dynasty, uh, which may or may not be ancient. I'm not really sure what ancient starts and ends, but anyway. Um, and, and many more people across the world. Um, in other words, uh, not 20 years of development in, in GIS modeling. I tell this story to make three points. One is that inquiry in the humanities is rooted in time, a time before disciplines when key thinkers were unhampered by the disciplinary boundaries we live with today. So all of these people have these massive list of things that we now call them and were considered to be all of them. It was a pre-disciplinary, radical, interdisciplinary, if you like. Um, um, Second, in each case, some notion of space and place was central to their intellectual endeavors. It wasn't something that was secondary. It was very important to all of these people who are obviously important people because um, you know, they've survived history uh, in their intellectual endeavors. Spatial thinking was not the invention of either the spatial turn, um, which influenced so many of us um, uh, in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s in the humanities, or in the advent of geocoding in GIS. Third, in many of these cases, forms of representation were key to their endeavors. What GIS is to us now, the invention of longitude and latitude, or papyrus, or cartographic pens, were to them. Fourth, this interest in space and place constantly met something we might today refer to as humanistic, an interest in the particularities of place with something we might now call scientific, the measurement and exactitudes of cartographic representation of space. During the Renaissance uh, in Northern Italy, the arts of cartography and landscape painting were reborn, uh, going backwards, um, hand in hand with the architecture of Alberti, as um, I'm sure Mona remembers from lectures from Dennis, or 
Um, this is a Dennis Cosgrove reference. Um, and the science of Leonardo. Humanism as a worldview reborn in the Renaissance was a worldview that included both the arts and the sciences within it. We often forget that science was part of that humanistic revolution. It was removing us from uh, another, another way of thinking. So these are entangled, of course, in Raphael's uh, painting of the school at Athens from 1509, where uh, Strabo and, um, and Ptolemy are in this corner with their globes, holding models of the world uh, as a central component of what it was of, of, to be in this sort of humanistic revolution. Which is to say that it would be too easy to take a reductive view of the geo-humanities, which is something I am very excited about, as emerging fully formed in the 21st century as a result of a sudden popularity of the prefix geo, which is taken to mean something like locatable on the Earth's surface. I refer to this geo as neo-geo. Um, Everything is geocoded and geolocatable. Things are geotagged. People go geocaching. Uh, um, the, the, the international, the Office of International Affairs at Northeastern is now called Geo, right? It's been renamed. So Geo, of course, comes from the Greek for Earth or ground, and it is this much older Geo that I would a retro Geo, if you like, that I would like to see included in the term Geo Humanities. Uh, the twin dangers facing this new endeavor are first that it's too easily reduced to technical exercise in using GIS for typically humanistic endeavors without any academic context um, that I pointed to in this talk, just briefly, some of, the, some of the thousands of years of history. And second, that it ignores all these developments and becomes a version of a, of a subdiscipline I know and love called cultural geography. Uh, it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't mean anything if it were just a new name for a subdiscipline. Um, so I hope that like the year's fellowship here at Northeastern, the Geo Humanities is genuinely interdisciplinary or even post-disciplinary. I hope that it does take the remarkable abilities of the digital humanities seriously, because I, mean, I think Peter demonstrated some of what they have to offer, and there is a lot more in terms of textual mapping and um, textual mining and all kinds of things that the new lab here does, which is an incredible um, uh, hive of industry. Um, 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 but does not take, the, take these abilities for something entirely new on the face of the earth. Finally, I hope that it does indeed help for, further what Stanley Fish calls the triumph of the humanities. I do not, however, believe that this triumph is a product of the theory wars of the 1980s, though I have no doubt that the last 30 years of insisting on the importance of spatiality uh, for social and cultural theory is massively important. And I think that the rise of the geo-humanities is more than the current instantiation of humanistic thought that has had spatial thinking at its heart um, uh, for the, uh, that arose around 2,000 years ago or whenever we want to put the start of it. So it's with this in mind that I've taken on um, the editorship of this AAG journal, which um, is uh, going to appear in October, um, along with my colleague Deborah Dixon in Glasgow. And despite its home in an august scholarly association of geographers, its editorial board will be, will be genuinely interdisciplinary and international, including both scholars and creative practitioners, artists, creative writers, musicians, all kinds of people are involved. Um, and it's the next phase in the process that the Geo Humanities volume Stanley Fish referred to was a key part of. And I hope that it can be a lively and inspiring as the conversations that we've been having in our Space and Place Fellowship have been uh, over the past year, which you're going to now hear a bit about. So I'm going to introduce some uh, people one by one to come up and tell you a little bit about what they've been doing um, so you can get a sense of really how rich, you don't have to have a geography department, really. I mean, it'd be good to have one. If anyone's got a, got a 50, 50 uh, Peter was telling me it'd be $50 million uh, it would cost for a new department or something. So if anyone's, any donors out there, that, we could do that. But without that, you do, you, we have people doing geography as far as I'm concerned, or doing geo-humanities, let's put it that way, in an interdisciplinary way. So, um, so I think if it, people come up one at a time and then sort of sit down after you've done your presentation, then this, this, this line will grow and then we'll have our conversation after that. Um, uh, so we'll do it in alphabetical order. So the first person up is Len Albright. Well, thank you uh, for everyone for uh, joining this conversation. And, and I'm uh, really appreciative to be here this afternoon or this morning. Uh, so my name is Len Albright. Um, I have a joint appointment in both sociology and public policy. So uh, my questions about space and place come partially from practical considerations in public policy where we think about what types of investment do the state and nonprofit sectors want to make to make society a better place, but also from a sociological theoretical perspective where I want to understand how the social world works. So uh, this photo is links. Does anyone know where this photo, people, people who don't know. <laughs> does anyone know, where, does anyone recognize this, uh, this photo? I'll give you a hint. 
So that gray fuzzy area back there, that's where Rocky ran up the steps. That's Philadelphia, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so that's uh, Philadelphia, the kind of uh, skyline back there, kind of in the image uh, a little bit closer would be uh, Camden. And this is uh, suburban Mount Laurel, New Jersey, about 10 miles. So, yeah, so this is Mount Laurel. Um, so Mount Laurel is a, is a suburb um, for people who know housing policy or for planning law that was famous for, in the late 60s, early 70s, being sued um, for something called exclusionary zoning. And basically what that meant was that the way that the town was zoned, the town said only single family homes can be built. And because only single family homes could be built, that meant a certain price point. So that zoning effectively excluded low income people from living in the town. So after the Fair Housing Act in the 60s, moved kind of forward, people started to realize this was not okay. There was laws, lawsuits that said it, exclusionary zoning is not okay. Although this continues in states around the country, but in New, New Jersey is a place where it's not allowed. So um, I'm interested in, oh, okay, so fast forward, took about 25 years, some low income housing finally started being built in Mount Laurel. And this is one housing complex called the Ethel Lawrence Homes. And this was built and named in honor of the woman who brought this lawsuit against Mount Laurel in the late 60s. So um, the, what I've been working on in the fellowship this year is a book project called Making It Out Here, uh, Imagined Futures in Suburban Low-Income Housing. And uh, this is primarily animated by this um, concept that is, you know, it exists in anthropology and geography, but um, sociologists are just starting to talk about the idea of imagined futures, this idea that we have some, some idea, some concept of where we're going, either individually or collectively, or maybe the state has some project to push us collectively somewhere, uh, and that this matters, that this imagined future has some real consequences. So I'm interested in both the imagined future of how did we get here? How did, how did this develop? And for people who are living in this low income housing, how do they make sense of how they got there? And this came from my, my very first interview. So I interviewed almost every family in this 140 unit complex. My very first interview, I sat down in someone's living room. They were really nice. They brought out some, some tea. And, um, and it was a, a woman maybe in her mid 20s. And she said to me, and I had my list of questions in front of me, like a diligent sociology grad student. And she said, so I guess you're going to ask me how I ended up out here. And I looked at my first question and said, how old are you? And I quickly realized that her question was much more interesting than mine. So I said, that was exactly what I was going to ask. Um, how did you end up out here? And I realized that there's this, um, these dual project. One, one, there's a very individualized project of mobility and an imagined future. But two, there's a state-sponsored project of mobility that's also occurring. So there's these two things that are responsible for how this housing ended up here. So um, briefly, what am I interested in? One, I'm interested in this idea of housing opportunity. So housing opportunity is not, equal, is not um, distributed equally. If you're trying to find housing in Boston, you know that firsthand. It's an incredibly expensive place to live. Uh, the suburbs are an incredibly expensive place to live. Um, that's political, that distribution of housing opportunity. And with that, other kinds of opportunity is also political. So access to housing in the suburbs in the 70s, 80s, 90s, meant access to suburban schools. Big difference between suburban schools and urban schools. Urban schools were tanking, suburban schools were doing great. And this was in part because of the finance and the political geography in which suburban housing was being taxed, more money to spend, better schools, higher property values, more tax, better schools, yes, 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 yes. So I'm interested in that politics of space and place and how the housing market and educational politics intersect. Second, I'm interested in this <clears throat> concept of place-based mobility programs. So um, the state uh, is interested in, um, implicitly is interested in economic and social mobility for its citizens. And one of the ways that it incentivizes this is through subsidizing stuff. It subsidizes our uh, childcare, it subsidizes our food, subsidizes education, it subsidizes our mortgages. Another way that the state tries to subsidize mobility is by encouraging people to move where there's um, little packets of resources that the state thinks can lift people up. So that's what's happening in, in a place like New Jersey. And we're seeing this happen in New Jersey, we're seeing it happen in Massachusetts with, um, with a program called 40B. We see it happen in California with the housing element law in Maryland, in Westchester County. It's happening all around the country where the state is interested in using the power of place and its associated resources um, to make a good investment to help pe people be economically and socially mobile. And then one other thing that's occurring, so it, this is about housing equity and opportunity. It's about place-based mobility programs. 
Uh, this is also about poverty deconcentration. So in the 60s and 70s, most of the subsidized housing in the United States was going into uh, inner cities and was primarily being located in very high poverty regions. So just by the virtue of needing a housing subsidy, you ended up having to move into a very high poverty neighborhood. And um, the, the big case, and that was the Gautreau decision in Chicago, in which the Chicago Housing Authority um, basically uh, uh, was found guilty uh, or culpable for deliberately placing low-income people in high poverty neighborhoods. And one of the remedies was that they had to move people. They had to deconcentrate that poverty. And they moved people to the suburbs. And the federal government ended up building an entire program on that called Moving to Opportunity. So another reason that people are ending up in places like this is because the state is trying to right a wrong. The state has basically sanctioned poverty concentration in the cities and is now trying to figure out, wow, you know, we're investing in urban schools, we're investing in urban nutrition, and we still can't break these, these cyclical poverty problems of poverty. So a new idea is, okay, well, we can incentivize moving to the suburbs. So um, housing uh, opportunity, uh, place-based mobility programs, and poverty deconcentration are all state reasons that this is occurring. Uh, my book is also about um, what's going on in people's minds. How do people's uh, concepts of their imagined futures animate these moves? Uh, a lot of people moved from Camden or Philadelphia to Mount Laurel, and they moved far away from their jobs, from their social networks and their support, and they thought, <laughs> there's a little pause, pause break back here, and they, um, uh, a woman said she'd never seen a goose before. And she said the first day that the geese walked out from the pond or backyard, she called the police. Because she thought, this, this, they're going to take over my house. They're coming for me. You know, they've, you, you know they're, they're organized. Um, and uh, it, you know, for a lot of people, this is a, this is a very different move. And, and I, I think it's very interesting to, to understand um, these futures that people hold in their minds. Um, how, do they, how do they animate major moves like this? How does it animate the networks that they, that they create? Um, the coordinations of their futures together. How does this um, animate the types of asks against the state that people have? And uh, you know, is this just is this a is this a temporary stopping ground out here? Um, and then people are going to you know try to get on their feet and go back to the city. Is this seen as just some kind of subway on kind of train path of mobility? Um, so that that's where I'm at, and that's what I've been thinking about throughout this semester. I've benefited greatly from our, our interdisciplinary conversations, and I uh, just want to thank uh, Tim and everyone for that. So I've said this a few times over in previous uh, um, presentations we've had, but I'll say it again. One of the great joys of um, uh, this fellowship is having um, PhD students, grad graduate students as part of it. They are a couple of graduate student fellows who, who are doing remarkable work that has taught us much. And one of these is Emily Artiano, and um, she's next. She's from the English department, so something, like I said, something different. Hi, um, as Tim said, I'm Emily Artiano. I'm a PhD candidate in the English department, and I study early American literature. Um, so I want to thank the Humanities Center and the College of Social Science and Humanities uh, for this fellowship opportunity. It's been fantastic. I just wanted to take a few minutes to talk about, just reflect on my fellowship experience and what I've gotten out of it. So my dissertation focuses on the phenomenon of linguistic colonization, or colonization by way of language. As for instance, when colonized diasporic Africans and Native Americans were forced to abandon their mother tongues in favor of English. Through linguistic colonization, language becomes both a way to claim space and declare palatial identity and belonging. Rather than purporting a unidirectional story of conquering space and cohering place through language, my project seeks to make, the, make visible the nuances of linguistic colonization and the multidirectional influences of language through literary texts, such as Mary Rowlandson's Captivity Narrative and Phyllis Wheatley's Poetry. So coming into this fellowship, I knew that my project was invested in questions of space and place in relation to language and identity, and the readings and discussions um, of the geographic turn in humanistic studies have informed my sense of linguistic exchange as, spatially and as a spatially and temporally situated act. With this theoretical framework, I've been able to revise my dissertation to much better reflect the critical role social space plays in my discussion of language and identity, specifically in the way language acts constitute colonial and national space. A notion that I and several others have returned to over the course of the fellowship um, has been this idea of the meeting up of histories, um, a term Doreen Massey uses to describe the way that space is produced and constituted. And this idea really helped me to conceive of my project um, um, in some new ways. And rather than just thinking of linguistic colonization and literary responses as negotiations of space, 
I was able to think of um, these linguistic acts as creating space through multiple stories and narratives. I began to think through how characters and narrators um, in the text I consider narrate space and how they narrate movement. So for example, I thought about Mary Rowlandson's connection to place through language, but through the fellowship readings and discussions, I actually wrote about how she moved through and narrates the space, and this map behind me is one that I found that traces her and moves throughout the narrative, and also thinking about the geographic history of the publication itself. Likewise, I looked at the ways in which Phyllis Wheatley's poetry, um, or Phyllis Wheatley narrates through her poetry her movements in poems like On Being Brought from Africa to America, and in so doing contributes to the making of social space through her language. Um, in applying to the fellowship, I declared that I had an interdisciplinary project, which I did. I um, largely draw from rhetoric and composition studies. I use translingualism and code meshing theories to account for rhetorical authority garnered or seeded by writers working in multiple languages. And as I reread this dis my dissertation this past week to prepare for my defense on Tuesday, it's clear to me, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it's clear to me that it has become increasingly inter-transdisciplinary over the course of the year. As a result of recommendations from others during the fellowship meetings, I've read works in feminist social theory and geography, um, works by Iris Marion Young and Ifu Tuan, respectively, which have given me a theoretical way to write about home and naming, which are two important concepts in my work. I thought about my project in new ways, not just as a result of the feedback that um, these other wonderful fellows gave me on my own work, but from reading theirs as well. Megan's work resonates with me when I consider how multiple narratives must coexist to understand a historical moment. Serena's insights, um, she's not here today, but she does studies of refugee camps. Um, her insights keep pushing me to reconsider what it means to be a national versus an extranational subject and how space functions differently for subjects in relation to belonging and unbelonging. This is really pertinent to my work in colonial and early national America, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, Len's work brings issues of spatialized power to the forefront and encourages me to be more deliberate in how I think about power and domination. James' work reminds me um, to consider motivations behind how people define and categorize space in particular ways. Gretchen and Kathleen have turned my attention to the stories people tell about physical space that they occupy and the stories that the land itself can tell. And Bert has demonstrated how to integrate several seemingly disparate disciplines, analyzing corporate space, drawing on archival materials, economics, and psychology. Um, and Tim has served as just an incredible resource for all things space and place. Um, so I am very grateful for the opportunity to have worked with such an intelligent group of people, and it has really um, helped my own project in so many useful ways. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. It gets exciting as the seats start to fill up here. Um, so our, our next um, uh, fellow is um, James Connolly, who's an assistant professor of political science and public policy. And um, again, you will see a dramatic change of subject matter, but hopefully there's some continuities. Uh, so dramatic change of subject matter. Um, but I also want to thank the Humanity Center and my fellow fellows for really a great year, a very enriching year that I've, I've gained a lot um, from my experience here. And I wanted to just take a couple minutes, and I'm actually going to time myself here, uh, to, um, to talk very briefly without any much depth on my project and, and just talk about two points that I've really developed over this year that have, been, that have really been added to my project as my experience, part of my experience here of really digging into these notions of space and place. Uh, so I'm broadly interested in, my, my research is broadly interested in urban environmental governance. I, I'm in the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs. I'm primarily an urban planner and policy uh, um, practitioner, policy scholar. Um, I also have a dual appointment in the political science department. So the kind of policy and politics of, of urbanization is, is where I am. Um, and my project for the fellows is an emerging project. It's a, it's a new one for me. And it's focused on urban environmental governance at the mega regional scale. And the image you're looking at here gives you an example of what, what's meant by that usually in the policy conversation. Uh, this is from an organization or a set of organizations known as America 2050, which put out this report that said there's 11 emerging what they called mega regions in the United States. And essentially they argued that if, if the United States wants to be globally competitive, and this is very much the language they used uh, for economic growth, then they need to be focused on building infrastructure at this mega regional scale. Then they, the country, uh, we as a country need to be focused on this. Um, and they identified these 11 geographies and actually put boundaries around them, which is sort of controversial or very controversial in many, in many ways. Um, so I, my project mostly is trying to complicate this a little bit and say, um, one, I'm interested in, in, the, in the, the actual idea of mega regional 
place, uh, the, the notion, that does it exist? But really, one, one important concept for me that has developed this year is this notion that these are very much an imagined geography. These are something that you know, America 2050 and a number of other people have imagined this as a place and are putting it out there. And it's serving certain interests in the way that they're imagining it. Um, and those interests are not so much focused on environmental uh, implications, for example. Um, they're very focused on economic implications and infrastructure growth. Uh, so I want to, um, A, point out this sort of imagined geography aspect uh, and the policy implications that derive from it. Um, and then uh, another notion that is very important for me that has also developed over this year and, and very much through my interactions uh, with the fellowship is the notion that um, it's not just that there are environmental implications from, from mega regional growth, but that these implications signal perhaps a new set of environmental dynamics of sort of social ecological dynamics within urbanization if you're going to think about it in terms of this geography. Um, so there's a very rich uh, prior literature on urban environmental, urban environmentalism and urban environmental history, and we engage that literature uh, in, in many ways in, in the, throughout the year. Um, but this literature is very much focused on the direct impacts of resource extraction driven by earlier industrial era urbanization. Uh, and it gives us a lot of, a great, a lot of great frameworks. There's, there's some amazing analysis in this area. But I want to put forward the notion that mega regional placemaking, if you're going to think about this imagined geography and, and what it means to, to uh, create urban environmental governance and policy at this level, then you need to be thinking about kind of a new era of, of urban environmental history at the same time. And that um, there are specifically movements of, of key elements such as carbon, phosphorus, nitrogen that are associated with this type of urbanization. And that managing that process, with this, that is to say there are biogeochemical implications, there are system-wide environmental implications to this type of urbanization and building infrastructure and economic growth at this scale. So I want to, um, in my project, what I'm doing is using GIS analysis to try to make visible some of these social ecological processes at the mega regional scale that in fact have these biogeochemical implications and say that there are environmental policy making and planning um, uh, uh, directives that come out of, of making this part visible. So it's a part of mega regional growth that I think America 2050 does not sort of focus on making visible that I want to and, and, and argue that the policy world needs to be concerned with this. Thank you. Thanks, James. Um, our second uh, graduate fellow is Megan Doran, um, who is um, from sociology. Uh, again, uh, I think we definitely benefit from the participation of PhD students in the fellowship, and it's been wonderful to have Megan involved. So, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, my name is Megan Doran. I'm a PhD candidate in the sociology department. Um, the focus of my project, which is my dissertation research, is to look at the role of memories of the past in um, urban politics. So to do this, I explore the crisis over school desegregation and busing that occurred in the 1970s in Boston as it's remembered in Boston in politics in the city today. And what I did is I um, kind of traced a whole process of um, school assignment reform and education politics. Um, over a two-year period, and I interviewed participants in it. Um, when I first heard the theme of this project, this fellowship, I thought, okay, place. My project is about a place. Great. Um, <laughs> and I think it's really easy for urban sociologists. You know, I consider myself an urban sociologist, and what I realized very quickly is it's very easy for urban sociologists to actually take place as a given. It becomes kind of a backdrop or a setting. And the challenge for me for this um, fellowship has really been to um, take place and make that more central to my own analysis. And it's been amazing to engage with a, a group of scholars really doing some of the same things. Um, and that's really been invaluable for me to, to do that. So, so how did I do that? Um, you know, I have a picture here. It's not a map or a kind of aerial view of a place. It's, it's a story, right? And what I was really interested in is in the stories of this history and how they matter. When I started my project, I would explain my topic and people would say, hear me say, oh yeah, memories, history, present, politics. And they say, oh, busing. <laughs> Let's talk about busing, you know? And, and, and um, whether it's kind of from an academic place, Let's talk about um, race and class and busing and what's the true story of that, or whether it's from a um, 
you know, more local plays of what really happened, what was this event really about, or what was that event really about. Um, and I'd be like, well, my, my, my study's not about this history so much. Like, I, don't, I can't tell you the truth of this story. I can't tell you the truth of this history. What I can tell you is how people talk about it today and how they kind of use this story today. Um, so I, when I was first writing about the project, I was really trying, trying to distance myself from the past in a way, to separate myself from the history. And I think um, one of the biggest impacts of this fellowship has been, um, has been not to shy away from the past, but just to approach it in a different way. And I did this precisely through bringing in place. I've worked to understand a relationship between time and place rather than distancing from it. And that's what the chapter I ended up developing for this fellowship was really about. I focused on the changing narrative of Boston's identity over time for understanding, um, as a context for, context for understanding the desegregation crisis as a cultural trauma. So what I really tried to do is trace that identity through to the present day and, and look at how the narratives told and contested about this history within that context really um, uh, represented some future imaginaries, right? I've, I've heard a lot of people, um, my fellows talk about imaginaries, right? This is really how um, the stories we tell about this past is really about how, how we imagine the future. Um, so I just want to say that um, when I came into this fellowship, just as a kind of side note to the conversation that was happening earlier, I, was, I said, OK, space and place. I'm going to learn what those two things are, right? <laughs> this is space and this is place, and we're going to come out of a de with a definition of it. Um, not so much. I think, I think um, because we all came with such different starting points, backgrounds, approaches, part of this work has been to develop a common language around space and place. But I also wouldn't just say that we, and after 10 months together, might all give you the exact definition of those concept, concepts or that we've come to any uniform agreement. For myself, I'd say that my thinking about space and place um, was relatively kind of static and underdeveloped. I would have told you something about space as a container and place as, as, as meaning making. Um, but now I think I've just been able to understand space and place more dynamically. And working with a whole group of scholars has really opened me up to the different ways that those two concepts can be used. And I, I look forward to kind of discussing that more with you all today. Thanks, Megan. Um, so our next fellow is my colleague in history, uh, Gretchen Hefner, who um, is um, going to tell you about sand and deserts and, and engineers. So as Tim mentioned, I'm a historian, and I have a map and pictures. Um, and what I want to talk about just for a couple minutes is how I tell stories. This is what historians do. We tell stories. We narrate things. And what I want to talk about is how my actually views of narrating changed over the course of 10 months. And to be honest, I didn't even realize it had happened until the other day. I sat down and be like, OK, what did I learn? <laughs> um, and I, this sort of dawned on me. So um, I'll start with this little map. Up here is a map of some of the places I'm interested in, just a few of them. Um, and those are military installations. These are nodes on the sort of American global system of military power that was constructed in the late 40s and early 50s. Um, and I, that is what I'm interested in. And I think, like Mona, I'm interested in the construction of the American empire. I locate it sort of later with this military uh, infrastructure. Um, and I'm also interested in the materiality of it, um, the construction of these bases, what goes into actually making them happen. And so I look, this is why Tim mentioned engineers, I look at military engineers and how they go in a, a really sort of radically rearrange material environments um, to fit particular ends. And in this case, they want to build runways uh, barracks, fences, roads, things like this. It's very specific what they want to do. Now these two images are the place that I've been looking at um, this semester. Uh, and you, this kind of gives you maybe a sense of where it is. Um, this doesn't. This tells you nothing. But this is Libya. This is Wheelis Air Force Base in Libya. Um, and the sort of blueprints and plans that the military engineers had all, in fact, look like this. So an Air Force base, and this is sort of intentional, right? An Air Force base in New Jersey is supposed to look just like the Air Force base in Libya, just like the Air Force base in Morocco, just like the one in Iceland. They have a set of plans, a set of techno, sort of techno-scientific plans and designs that they are going to take in the late 1940s and early 50s and implement around the world in these various nodes. Um, this, of course, doesn't happen, right? And we can sort of all assume, we know, right? Technology does not transfer particularly easily. It gets kind of, there is no frictionless travel. 
right? Uh, so the engineers show up in Libya and they realize um, the environment is going to befuddle us, right? We have to work with sand. We have to figure out that they learn, for example, that you cannot make concrete out of the sand of the Saharan desert because it's too round and it won't congeal together. Uh, and this is something they sort of discover and realize, oh, we have to ship sand in from Yugoslavia, of all places. Um, so they're sitting on all this sand, but they can't use it, uh, which is a sort of delicious irony. Um, <laughs> but there's all these things. They realize the environment constrains them, right? Um, and they're concerned about it. And, and this is kind of where I was going with this story. I was thinking about how do the engineers show up and have to change their plans based on where they are. Um, but I actually think there's a more interesting story to this. Um, and that, in a sense, is how the environment might also shape their intentions. It's not that they're just coming in with a set of ideas that they have to change. There's actually something else happening, and it's coming from a different direction. So that's kind of what I've gotten interested in, is these, where these narratives are coming from. Where do I find the story? Where do I tell the story, right? Is it the engineers, or is it something else? Um, and I'll just sort of end and. Um, explain myself with a sort of example. I tend to think of these things in these weird 3D images, and so I'm going to share them with you. <laughs> um, the first one that I would say that I come in, that I came into the fellowship with was this idea that history was sort of like a topographical map, right? And every narrative was a transparency that I sort of laid on top of it. So I would sort of say, oh, here's you know, the engineering story. Here's the local Libyan story. Here's the story about scientific knowledge. Here's the UN story. And they'd all sort of layer on top in these transparencies, and you'd get this more fuller, richer sense of what this place looked like. Um, I don't think of it that way anymore. And I, and I apologize, I might be totally ripping off something that one of you gave me, and I don't remember who, so I apologize. But I now think of it as uh, a ball made out of rubber bands. Um, and it's like one of these rubber band balls that my kids actually make. And I wanted to bring one in, I should say, but my son was like, Mom, you know what happens when you bring things to school, don't you? <laughs> I think he was accusing one of you of possibly stealing my rubber band ball. Um, so a ball of rubber bands that you'd slice it open and you'd see all these different strands and threads. And those are the stories, right? This is kind of what Doreen Massey calls the, I think, radical simultaneity or radical multiplicity. And it's those stories that I'm interested in telling. Um, so that's kind of my goal coming out of this, is to tell these radical stories through good historical narratives. Um, these multiple stories. I'm not sure how they're going to fit together yet, <laughs> right? Um, but that's where I'm heading with it. So Tim mentioned sand. I, I was writing about engineers, and now I think I'm actually going to write about sand instead. Um, it'll be related, but thank you. Thanks, Gretchen. Um, so our next fellow is Kathleen Kelly from the Department of English. Uh, Perhaps on your way over to this building, uh, you notice there's a big construction project across the street. Uh, what part of that uh, project is they're building an arc that will connect this part of the campus over the tracks to the other part. Uh, we're going to have our own high line because they're, uh, it will be planted. So I wanted to point out to you that the Green City Spaces Colloquium is continuing. And so this, uh, today at 4.30 in Renaissance Park, uh, we'll have a group of people talking about the ARC. Uh, and then on uh, Friday, and this is in the back of your program, uh, you can sign up for a walking tour of the uh, Muddy River Daylighting Project, because they're taking part of the river out of the conduit. So I wanted to let you know about that. So I'm working on a book titled Lost and Invented Ecologies in Medieval Romance in which I read medieval literary texts as witnesses to natural places that either no longer exist or have changed dramatically. In my final chapter, I consider, I consider invented in the sense of fictitious, passed off as real, and offer a thick description of my neighborhood that includes such actants as glaciers, ponds, amateur archeologists, Vikings, and maps. Along the way, I started developing another project on representation and place. All of us fellows have used images to supplement our work on place, yet these images generate their own narratives apart from our work. So Emily's image of America represents a European colonizing ideology graphically gendered. In Edward S. Casey's distinction, it is not true to the geography of America, but it does capture the truth about Europeans and how they projected their desires on that landmass to the West. Here is bird still of Billy Wilder's American white collar workplace with its dreary topography of desks and converging lines of overhead lights 
receding into infinity. Not a map, but map-like. It reminds me of early efforts to rationalize the map through gridding. The problem is landscape and people don't fit into regularized squares very well. There's always something left over, what Derrida calls the supplement, that contradictory something extra that completes, that is, enhances presence, but also demonstrates the impossibility of completion, that is, absence, which is another definition for a map. When I look at this photograph, I see a carefully composed scene, a version of the 19th century bird's eye view map somehow evacuated of temporality. I find it uncomfortably aesthetically pleasing, and it's a very distancing of human life, bare life as Agamben would say. The so-called temporary tense resolve into a recognizable village grid, a place that is not supposed to exist as a place, as Serena explained to us. However, this image makes it so. In Neuromancer, William Gibson imagines a congested Boston to Atlanta corridor named the Sprawl. Apparently, we're on our way there, as James suggests in the map that he made of the Boston to Wa uh, Washington mega region. Michel Foucault describes the archive as, quote, systems that establish statements as events and things. Jane's map is indeed an invented map, as perhaps all maps are. As with Serena's photograph, and as James recognizes, the very existence of such maps reifies the mega region as a thing, and as a thing that must be addressed, and thus further reified by public policy. In a way, the meaning of the Google map resides in its digital frame. Once that is cropped off as here, it is up to us to furnish the narrative. Len does so by drawing a red line around the Ethel R. Lawrence affordable homes. Otherwise, what is, it to, what is to distinguish it from the other complexes? Only Len's work on the ground can tell us that. Megan's image, Boston painted as a new Venice, represents the vision of early 20th century city planners. This romantic, dreamy picture recedes like Wilder's workplace into a fuzzy future. Gretchen's map of the United States superimposed on North Africa is my favorite image. Like Gaul's America, it is so obviously a projection in the Freudian sense, as well as the cartographic, of an unvarnished colonizing desire. Libya is reduced by the US Army Corps of Engineers to a logistical problem made by violent analogy with the American West. And finally, here is an 1879 bird's eye view, not of my neighborhood in Cambridge, but of Watertown, the town next over. I peer into the map, only to realize that my neighborhood is out of sight over the hill. It's an uncanny feeling, expecting to see what I know is there, but isn't. So viewed, this map dramatizes the problem of margins, frames, presence, and absence. None of the images that I've shown tell us where we are in time and place and space, except perhaps for the Google map if we imagine ourselves as the satellite's eye. But all of these images shape our intellectual, emotional, and kinetic experiences of the places that they represent. Many maps keep us from getting lost in the present, but these maps, I would like to suggest, invite us to get lost in the past, real or imagined. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so fine, uh, I should mention Serena Perek is one of our fellows who couldn't be here today because she got an exciting invitation to be in Norway, so you can understand that. Um, maybe she hadn't had enough snow this summer anyway. Um, it's winter, winter even. So Serena was working on ethics and uh, work on refugee camps. You just saw an image there and trying to think about what ethical responses to refugees might be in a philosophical framework. Uh, the final um, fellow is Bert Spector, and Bert is a special place uh, in our hearts and in our fellowship because Bert was not a member of the College of Social Science and Humanities. We also have uh, fellows from outside of the college, as long as their deans are willing to, to give them their course release. And, um, um, and Bert is in the, uh, the business school, the, um, the, school or the school of business, I should say. Uh, so, Bert. So the one point that 
uh, hasn't been made, and I'll make it, and that, that it, was, it was just fun. You know, it, uh, it was just a particularly coming out of the School of Business, uh, and I do have to thank my dean for giving me the course release time. Uh, but, Tim, the announcement of the triumph of the humanities has not yet reached the School of Business. Um, so uh, there are a, well, there, it's still very much a positivist social science uh, framework there. So it's just, it's just a great pleasure to come uh, and, and talk to these folks and listen to the, the, talk, the speakers. There is a small group of us operating in the Academy of Management, but it's just, it's a great, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to do that. So thank you, thank you all for just the fun of it. Thanks, Lori and Tim, for uh, in, inviting me to do that. Uh, so uh, as, as Kathleen said, this image, uh, is not this this image would not be accepted as as evidence for, from a social science perspective it is not a picture of a business organization it is a picture of a movie set it is a representation of a tension uh, that was existing in the 1950s the movie was made in 1960 the apartment by the way was made in 1960 and and my argument and I, and I, I loved Mona I loved your conversation this morning about your about your book and uh, I told her I was going to definitely read that, and that is that she talked about Interna International Harvester and Singer, which were uh, exceptional uh, organizations when they appeared, and my argument about the 1950s is that's when two things happened. One is the exceptional became more commonplace, and secondly, something different happened in business from a strategy perspective, and that was the notion of diversification. So now you had companies that didn't just make sewing machines or didn't, didn't just make farm equipment, but just invested in businesses simply because it was a good investment. Also, by the way, be, to avoid antitrust uh, lawsuits. So there are reasons for it. And, and what I uh, came into this seminar wanting to study was the, the social tensions that existed within uh, that setting and the, uh, the ways that uh, executive management uh, found to ameliorate those tensions, which was the introduction, the insertion, the insistence, I guess, I'd even go as far as to say, of the application of psychology, industrial psychology, to the workplace. And that's been really my uh, project during the year and uh, to, get, to finish an article on that. One of the things that came out, however, of the, the year and I think I'll either credit or blame Tim for this, but uh, is also to think about, uh, Kathleen at some point, or yeah, Kathleen at some point said, am I thinking about space and place metaphorically or realistically? And I said, duh, I don't know, I don't know. So I, I uh, thank you for, I like being asked tough questions. So I, 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 I thought really I was thinking metaphorically, but then uh, Tim pushed me also to think about place and space in this period of time, uh, literally as well. And I, I think that's going to be my next project, which is to think about, uh, this is, a, again, this is an image done with, uh, I was going to say literally smoke, smoke and mirrors. There's no smoke in here, but there is mirror. There are mirrors in here to make that look like it's a never-ending office space. But what was going on in the real office space? Uh, in what sense were the uh, dynamics of industrial psychology, which, by the way, I would define as the dynamics of adjustment. That is, how do we get these folks to not just cram themselves into this space, but enjoy themselves, or to at least fool themselves into thinking they're enjoying themselves. Um, if you remember the end of this movie, if anybody saw the end of this movie, it doesn't work. He leaves, which is not a good outcome by the way, from the perspective of the corporation. Uh, so uh, in what regard was the physical space dictated, shaped, or understood by the, first of all, the psychologist, secondly, the designer, and thirdly, the executives themselves who were making the decisions? In what way was all of this used to shape what I think is the, the dynamic of adjustment. Now, maybe as I get into that, I'll find that there's another dynamic unfolding as well. It's not just adjustment, but I'm willing to be open to that. But I think what's going on here is how do we get folks to adjust to this new reality. So thank you all very much for the opportunity. Thanks. Um, so now we have the opportunity for a half an hour of conversation. I mean, I have some questions that I had circulated to people here, but we don't have to just listen to me ask questions. I mean, we can carry on 
people in the audience, which is now almost the same size as the people up here, um, uh, could converse in some way. But, um, but I will start by asking everybody a question that I think is important in terms of um, uh, in terms of the way this fellowship works or any other kind of fellowship works, which is the value of interdisciplinarity. I mean, interdisciplinarity is something that um, uh, funding bodies are saying is the way forward. Um, the National Science Foundation says that. The uh, National Endowment of Humanities says that. Um, it's, it's said in the UK as much as it's said here. And we've all, we also hear it's a, a good way to learn things. And the, the, the academy is you know, breaking up or, or starting to think about breaking up disciplines and silos in particular ways. And Northeastern in particular, you know, hires people on sort of interdisciplinary, you know, like I'm in two, two, two things at once in, in history and uh, international affairs and other people are also doing that increasingly. So, I mean, you've talked a little bit about this in some of your reflections on the time here, but what do you, I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you think it works? Does it work well? Is it something that, 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 um, you know, you, you feel safer in your discipline or is it some, bringing something else to you that you think is useful? Anyone that wants to, James looks Maybe I'll just make a quick yeah. comment on that. Yeah. Um, I think the one thing that it really did for me is something that, um, that Kathleen highlighted in, in her in her talk here is that, um, uh, I mean, certainly there was just, there was sort of day-to-day -day benefits of hearing of hearing interactions from people that, that were coming from contexts that were not my own. But but the real value, I think, for me was was the fundamental challenges that you get that are really, you can't get from within, this, within your discipline because your discipline has built a certain set of accepted norms around certain things that don't tend to get challenged. So you get I, mental challenges about, you know, um, I mean, the, the, the policy world is built in a certain way, and, and, and there's a lot of things to fundamentally challenge there that don't get challenged in, by policymakers or policy uh, scholars in, in a way that that uh, that people from other other disciplines would challenge and I got some of those challenges here and I think that they made me think more deeply at least if not rethink a, a number of things anyone else I mean you have to have an incredible array as you saw of different kinds of subject matters and disciplines I, uh, I was just gonna say I think that one of the benefits um, for me for interdisciplinarity is you get so entrenched in your work that sometimes it's hard to see what's going to be a value outside of your discipline and what people are going to find interesting and also what you really have to elaborate on and explain to make sense to to be a value to people outside your discipline and that was really important for me um, to kind of practice that and also just see what really stuck out to other fellows that maybe d didn't really stick out to people in my department Else. I was uh, totally blown away when Gretchen presented her work from the field of philosophy about the um, kind of moral imperative around allowing for. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Serena. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's all swirling in my brain. The interdisciplinarity. <laughs> um, Serena was presenting about the kind of moral imperative to, to do away with refugee camps, and she was just saying that this, the very premise, the model of a refugee camp, is just morally unacceptable. This idea of a stateless person who you know states basically negotiate to give away the you know the um, the uh, obligation or the you know the the morality to to treat these people well and that just like blew me away in sociology if I was to make a moral claim for something I mean you, I can make a political claim I can maybe make an economic claim but the idea of a moral claim just I was like <laughs> and and I um, it just made me think about my work in a, in a whole different way I started conceptualizing um, resources in the suburbs, not as resources, but as rights. And that these state projects are not just about distributing rights, they're about, uh, about distributing resources, they're about distributing rights. And if you think about something like an expansion of geography of, uh, a geography of opportunity in the suburbs in which there's an opportunity to elaborate on your rights, to deepen them, whether they're uh, all the different types of rights that the state protects. And then in the inner city in the 60s and 70s, you had a compression of these rights where you had the development of a carceral state where you know basically the rights of an inner city citizen became reduced and the rights of a, um, of a, um, of a suburban citizen were, were subsidized and, and increased. So you had this dual parallel of citizenship, and that's where we're seeing the fights in places like Ferguson, Missouri, over this very issue. It's about what does it mean to be represented? What does it mean to, 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 to have associated rights with a place? And I, I never would have thought about rights in that way had not been for the conversation from philosophy. Should we make a commitment one to, uh, to bring moral claims into sociology? We'll, we'll end up with a round table at, our, at the... <laughs> I mean, I must admit, it feels, uh, I'm not a sociologist, but it seems, I mean, you 
must, someone somewhere must be making moral, ethical claims in sociology. <laughs> <laughs> See, they're, they're, they're ganging up. <laughs> this is um, good feedback. It's a different thing, though. The, the moral philosophy is a different way of thinking about moral claims, I think, than the, than the kinds of claims we might make in a more political arena but in social science. And, and I guess I would say specifically, at least how I've been trained to see urban sociology, uh, I had, just hadn't been illuminated the way that, that talking about that distribution of rights geographically, yeah. particularly in places like the suburbs. It was always a... It was an expansion of, a, expansion of a particular kind of racial privilege or a particular kind of class privilege. But it was also this expans expansion of rights that I just hadn't thought about in that way. So um, Kathleen's uh, presentation there, she got everyone to present, to give her an image. Um, and one of the things that came, we didn't focus on, but came up quite strongly, I think, was um, uh, the link between spatiality and visuality. And I wonder if anyone wants to further that or, or say anything about if that was something that you were thinking about during the process. And then Kathleen. <laughs> well, I, I started out uh, with the intention with my project, I, I did not want to talk about symbols and representation. Uh, like, like you said earlier, Mona, I wanted to talk about the real stuff, the real environment, uh, the materiality, and images just kept getting in the way. Uh, and so uh, I, I've been sort of, in my response to uh, the new materialism, part of that is don't throw representationality away. Let's hold on to it. It's useful. Uh, it can. It, it's part of a network. It can. Uh, you know. It, it has the ability to make things happen. And so I'm trying to deal with representationality in that respect. And so w as I look at the archive, it's not just moving through the archive to use this mater these materials and these maps and other images and photographs, but consider how they're shaping. As I was saying. Uh, our, you know, how we how we write history, how we tell stories, how we interpret. 